So now we need to begin looking at the actual content of Dei Verbum by Vatican II. So here's Dei Verbum in chapter 1 talking about the nature of revelation itself. In his goodness and wisdom God chose to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will, by which through Christ the Word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Through this revelation, therefore, the invisible God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to men as friends, and lives among them, so that he may invite and take them into fellowship with himself. So notice that when Dei Verbum is talking about revelation, it's not primarily talking about a book. It's primarily talking about Jesus Christ, that that is the ultimate revelation of God. And so the Old Testament will look forward to him, the Gospels will tell about him, and the New Testament will look back at what he did and also the continuing work of the Holy Spirit in the church to make Jesus known. But Jesus Christ himself is the full revelation of God, that when God wants to show who he is, he doesn't drop a book from the sky, he comes down from heaven as the God-man, Jesus Christ. Okay. So, a couple of things to note here. So, first of all, God chooses to reveal himself. That this isn't, revelation is not something we've discovered on our own. It's something God has freely chosen to show. And he shows us who he is so that we can become like him. So that we can become like God. Saint uh, Athanasius, a great saint of uh, the fourth century, said, God became man that men might become God. Pretty extraordinary. And the Council also notes that when God speaks, he speaks to us as a friend, not just as someone, not as someone who's, you know, lording his position over us, even though he's infinitely better and greater than we are, but someone who speaks to us out of love. So that's the, the first thing to note about divine revelation. The Council goes on to say, this plan of revelation is realized by deeds and words having an inner unity. The deeds wrought by God in the history of salvation manifest and confirm the teaching and realities signified by the words, while the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery contained in them. By this revelation, then, the deepest truth about God and the salvation of man shines out for our sake in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation. So what does all this mean? Well, the first basic idea is that God's deeds in history reveal the truth in the Bible's words, that the Bible says things uh, about God, but it's, it's God's work in history, in oftentimes miracles through the prophets, through, um, you know, prophecies coming true. Those are God's deeds, that they reveal the truth of the words and the truth of the prophets. But also, there are a lot of things that happens, deed that deeds that God does or allows to happen, and we can't know their true meaning apart from the Bible's word, because the Bible reveals kind of God's inner mind, which we can't see on our own. So we, we need something to reveal, what, okay, what was God thinking by allowing this thing to happen or that thing to happen? And so what Dei Verbum is asserting here of the connection between words and history is that this makes it different than a lot of the other stories that go on. So it's different than the, the you know, Greek stories about uh, Apollo and Dionysius and Ares, the god of war, and who was that one? Hermes. Apparently the Greeks didn't think their god should be wearing clothing. I, that's, that's my conclusion. Oh, look, Poseidon decided to put on a towel. How good of him. Okay, so, but the, but the Greek gods, um, you know, they, they were never really, uh, I think, worshipped as historical figures in the sense that Christians or Jews worshipped their God in that way. By the, by the time you get the high Greek civilization or high Roman civilization, the gods are important for cultural reasons and that sort of thing. But, you know, nobody, nobody gets burned at the stake for Apollo. You know, the, it's just a, a different kind of view of what are the stories of the gods supposed to tell us. And if you look at philosophers like Plato, they're going to be you know, asking um, kind of deep questions about, well, what's kind of behind the pantheon of gods that we see here? What is it that makes something truly good, that makes something truly right? Is it just because the gods are doing it? And he's able to ask that question because the Greek notion of the gods 
is that, well, they're very different looking from the Christian and Jewish conception of God. 